I don't, I don't actually, I don't have any agenda items. Is there anything that anyone wanted to talk about? I have a question I'll ask that I could probably just ask on GitHub instead, but do you know- um, we're, all, we're all sitting here, fire, <laughs> fire away. <laughs> the um uh, adaptive concern concurrency thing yeah um it's one of your coworkers working on it right yeah yeah i uh sorry go ahead uh, i'm just curious what the is there a timeline for it or is just as it when it gets done it's done um so we just merged the the concurrency controller which is the hard part oh, okay. uh, so he's working on the next set of PRs, he has a couple more PRs to do. So there's obviously stats and then there's the full like wired up with integration tests. Sure. So I, I think we're probably, you know, I want to, he's working on it as his first priority. So okay. I want to say like two weeks away. Yeah. And then um, our plan is to get it into staging pretty quickly and, okay. and, and get some, you know, get some traffic mileage on it. And I'm right. sure, there, sure there's going to be issues, but um, we're, we're really excited about it. Uh, so, you know, if there's, oh, sorry. So for people that don't know, um, we Lyft is porting, um, Netflix has used uh, an adaptive concurrency system for their internal microservice architecture for quite some time. Um, the, the big TLDR is that basically it, it's like a circuit breaker controller that works like TCP. That's the, that's the easiest way to think about it. So it detects failures and latency and then backs off and then does slow start. I mean, that's, you know, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically the way that it works. So in a, in a good situation, it avoids manual configuration of circuit breakers, which tend to go out of date. So for high throughput services, Netflix has found it to be very effective uh, for auto tuning circuit breakers. So we basically have been working with Netflix and took their algorithms and their papers and are porting it into a filter in Envoy. Um, as part of our effort to generally reduce the number of Envoy knobs that people have to configure, which are very confusing. So we're, we're very excited about this. Um, I think it's going to be great uh, from talking to Netflix. It, it, they, for reasons that we don't actually understand yet because we haven't deployed it, it doesn't work for all services just because the, I think the algorithms don't tend to work as well if the traffic patterns are bursty, um, you, you know, or if they're not regular. Um, but they have found it to be extremely effective for high throughput services that tend to be fairly steady state and not, not bursty. And those are the services that tend to self DOS anyway. So they, they have, they have found it to be very effective for reducing most of the self DOS type situations for high throughput services. So, yeah. So we're hoping to get that out soon and then there'll be a long deployment and, and big time, but if there's other people out there that are interested in helping to test that uh, or contribute. I, I think what we're trying to do is trying to get the basic version working. And then there's quite a bit of future work in terms of either better, more modern algorithms, being able to bifurcate the concurrency controls, either based on cluster or priority or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's that part that, someone here is particularly interested in. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing where if you wanted to shoot me an email, I can introduce you to Tony uh, and, and I can, I can connect whoever is interested and they can chat about it or feel free just to, just to talk about it on GitHub. Okay. Yeah. Wait, it is, did the person, I think someone just asked about this on I, GitHub. Is that yeah. that person? Yeah. He's, Okay. Uh, Matthew McKean is his name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, we can do it on GitHub or, uh, you know, if, if they want to talk to Tony directly, we can, I can make email intros. He seems pretty hot for it. So um, we'll see. We'll wait, I guess, until you get like sort of the basic version of landing. Yeah. And sure. And then maybe we'll contact you or we'll just do it online either way. Sure. Yeah. I, I think we would like obviously any, um, you know, any, any additional testing and, 
validation would be fantastic. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I don't think we have anything else in the agenda. Does anyone else have things they want to talk about? I actually wanted to, I guess while, is that Bill Rowe I see? Or William Rowe? Bill Rowe. Uh, the problem that you're having with the proto gen and command line length? Yeah, so, um, and I don't know how, first time I'm trying to use the app on Android's uh, phone, so. Uh, anyways, uh, the issue that we're having is exactly the problem that we originally had with Link and with CC um, or CL.exe on Windows. Um, we just have 8K or now 32K of uh, command line args, and we have an absurd number of includes to list. So um, it turns out Proto C is all we've supported. Uh, command line arguments uh, as a uh, uh, input list, a uh, args file input. And so if we can get that implemented, basically with that point, we are ready to run a whole bunch of fuzzing and other uh, protocol validation um, that can't be run right now on the Windows I think, I think those changes have to get made in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the upstream proto buff related projects. If I'm not mistaken, that's the sort of the conclusion that we came to with this for the OSX bug, and then I think it eventually got fixed, and then we never sort of circled back and closed the bug, or reported on it in there. But I think the problem was the proto protogen C or proto C whatever it is, the validation one, uh, was what was producing the huge command lines. I'm I'm still, by the way, trying to get someone from Microsoft to actually help with this, but not having much luck yet. I mean, this is just a straight up Bazel and. No, sure. I, I would just be be really nice. Hi, Microsoft out there, if you could help. So maybe maybe one day. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to let you know that because I think. Um... I think that's where the changes have to get made to fix this. And I think maybe we lost him. Oh. Uh, I don't know. The one nice thing for when he comes back or he listens to this is that I think now that we're on Azure pipelines, it should be really easy to get a Windows CI. So I oh, think right. we, could, we could get that going very quickly. Right. Um, just to back up for a moment, um, oh. when I was looking at Bazel and uh, not only Core Bazel but PGV, um, it seems like the the work that needed to be done to use command line of files has already been done for Java or PGV. Um, some of the built-in logic. So, like you said, there's you know a number. We have our Python uh, PGV generator macros in ourselves that we rolled. Um, if we can get those mainstreamed. Uh, to the to the typical implementation that's already built and baked in the base, then it works all done for us. Um, so that that was my impression just looking at the source code uh, two weeks ago. Um, as far as Azure, yes, I, I think that getting I, I totally expect Microsoft to support that. And I just wanted to point out that uh, just to give you an idea of Microsoft's attitude toward um, this all. Uh, the Visual Studio 2019 uh, actually came to baked in with Ninja, came baked in with CMake. Um, they're actually shipping most of the third-party tooling, and I see no reason why, you know, in the next iteration, there might not even be a base built into it. Yeah, it's, it, it's more that they have a port of Envoy that works on Windows. Uh, That's right. Uh, so I'm just trying to work offline to, to, to get them to help with the, with the open source side of things. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Which would be really nice. I was going to tell you on the Bazel front, I, I mean, and this would be my personal strategy, but you can obviously uh, you know, approach it however you want. 
I think honestly, when most people see the type of bugs that you're opening with basil, their eyes glaze over and, and they and they just run away screaming. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be probably easier for some of the specific issues if um, I can potentially help route them. You know, like it, right. I think we can maybe get you to people who can help you a little more directly just because I think when you open those kinds of issues or ask about them in Slack, I, I don't think anyone's actually going to going to answer. Okay. Well, no, actually, Elizana's done a great job of routing me uh, throughout this in terms of uh, redirecting me either to the PV, uh, PGV subproject, the Basil yeah. subproject. Uh, same with security and security. She's done a great job, again, routing, routing the issues. So it has been productive, and I'm just leading every question with, you know, which is the right forum, which is the yeah. GitHub project. Right. It, it's it's more that for some of the more arcane issues, like I don't know that even within Envoy community or Envoy Slack, you're going to get a great answer. And we may have to route you to people that actually work on Basil. We um, understand that. We, yeah, we, but, we, we know that going in. Okay. Yeah. But I'm just saying like, I think if you're, what I recommend is that for some of the more arcane stuff, I would time, time box it in terms of trying to figure it out and randomly ask people. And if you feel like you're blocked, maybe just reach out to me or Lizen over email or, 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 or both of us. And between the two of us, we can probably find someone somewhere who can help you. Okay. And thank you. Sure. Uh, I have something else I wanted to bring up. Sure. Um, um, so I, I, uh, I issued a PR to add um, an admin endpoint that would help um, us see whether or not in the conversion to stat symbol tables, we still have potential points of contention. And I guess this will only be useful if somebody actually runs it on live traffic at some point. So I wonder if, who, who might be willing to help do that? Of course that PR has to be iterated and merged, but. Um, don't, you, don't you run like a cloud service? Uh, we do, but we don't have a lot of traffic yet. Uh, we can do that on ours, but I don't think it'll be that interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, we can we can potentially do that. I, I just I have so many pans on the fire right now that I can't I can't promise when. Okay. Um, but I think there are many people out, out there that could probably help with some smoke testing. So, you know, this, this, this is this is I would say this is kind of an interesting topic that I don't I don't you know something that that's worth thinking about in terms of. I feel like every so often, every month or so, you know, we find ourselves with a change, whether it's the buffer change or like this change or something else, which is sufficiently scary that, you know, we would request that some people do some smoke testing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I I wonder if we could have some, some better process around this versus just randomly like asking people. And I'm not sure what that would be, but I mean, I think it's worth thinking about what that would look like. Yeah, I think I think that, and we could uh, ostensibly bribe people with, you know, again, early access security things or, or yeah. maintainers' privs or you know, some of the things that you get for contributing yeah. of like, okay, if you're willing to burn a bunch of time doing this, you know, you get a little bit more yeah. traditional sway. I think I think that's a great idea. I, I think that's something. Maybe when Harvey's back from vacation, since he seems to be working on most of, the, I think Piotr's also on vacation. Maybe when the two of them are are back, since they seem to do most of the security policy. Mm-hmm. I really like that idea of potentially bribing people to get onto the early distributor list if they're willing to do smoke testing of potentially scary because things. Especially we're gonna be doing, like we, we need it especially for that and then could use it for other things and it's kind of, uh, got the early security testing if you do the yeah. early. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about just in the sense that we obviously, we want, people who are going to drive enough traffic through it that it's that it's worthwhile so we need to think about what that would look like um 
but I do like that idea in terms of maybe, you know, they, they do some work, but they'll get something pretty nice in return. Um, I think that could help us a lot. Okay. Um, let me, let me make a note, actually, I, I'm just going to open a GitHub issue on this and maybe we can just do this discussion in public. Sounds good. Yeah. I love that idea a lot. Hold on a second. Let me take a note. Let me just un yeah, but in terms of this immediate one, um, you know, maybe, maybe the best thing to do would just be to, for now, just to like email Envoy Dev or something. I, I don't know, because that would at least reach people over, over email and they might see it and we could try to find some people. Sure. I also try to get, uh, see if I have contacts in Istio that can do this because. Yeah. I, 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 I guess, you know, I actually haven't looked at that PR yet. My only, my only concern about the, about the admin only solution is are there are there contention stats too just because i feel like with only an admin endpoint like no one's going to look at it or potentially notice you know so it's like having the admin endpoint for details is obviously fantastic i just wonder it seems like you need some higher level signal that you could monitor you, you, you know that maybe you're having some problem yeah, we do have a we do have the contention stat as you as you noted, it doesn't give you a lot of debug information. But, but that contention stat is only if you're running it on contention mode, right? And you can't, and you can't even tell. What do you mean by contention mode? Sorry, are we talking about, I mean, we're talking about two different things. There's the, we're not talking about mutex contention. We're talking about something different. Um, right, so, the, so there's this, the slash contention admin endpoint, which, um, actually, it's the same thing, it's even been endpoint, so you have to go look for it. But um, it will tell you if you actually have mutex contention in your live traffic, independent of where it comes from. And um, so that is at least a signal that is available that you could build into some kind of monitoring. Um, then um, we could, I, I had, um, considered adding some logging as well, which I can still do. Um, maybe, uh, I thought that was, I thought it would be pretty easy to add logging once we had the basic data there. Yeah. And I mean, on the, on the logging point, we also have this thing come up every month, which is, wouldn't it be nice if we had a log type, which logged only every whatever one second or, or X seconds which is very easy to implement, just like no one's ever done it. So, I mean, I, you know, that would be, I think, another useful thing potentially. Yeah, maybe that would be a motivation. So just, so just like doing that basic log primitive where we could do, we could do rate limiting on an individual log basis. Um, I think that would be a generally useful thing within Envoy. Uh, so, I mean, if, like, if, if that would be useful for this effort, it seems like a pretty low hanging fruit thing to implement. Sure. That sounds good. I, th I think that could be like a follow on to the current PR. Because yeah. All right. Let me, let me look through your, your current PR. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I actually really love the way that everything is coming together with the stat stuff. I, I'll, I'll admit that I'm still, I'm a little, it's, it's still complicated and I'm a little confused. It's not clear to me like what the performance cliffs are and how we would know about them. And like, I understand that's the work that you're doing now. It's just, that's where I become a little hazy, right? It's like when it's working well, I, I, I get how it works and it, it's pretty straightforward, but it's these edge cases that I'm not sure about. Yeah, fair point. Um, I don't think that we'll really do it until we run it on, on massive multi-core machines too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if in the end we decide this whole thing just isn't worth it, we can back that stuff out. I think along the way I found a lot more like memory and performance improvements that are already in <laughs> that are independent of actually symbolizing. But uh, the, the biggest thing is to symbolize. Wait, sorry, you're saying to potentially back out 
all all of symbolizing or just some of the built-in versus versus other stuff oh i i meant that if it looks like it's a complete disaster at least along the way i found a whole bunch of other stuff to make smaller yeah okay um but I, i'm i'm hoping we don't have to back it up but i'm not um i, I don't i i don't think we will either I, I i think the only thing that i'm curious about again is just some of the some of the dynamic stack cases and you know i i, I do think that with with better learning um uh, either from how to determine some of the built-ins or configure them or uh, i'm not sure but i feel like yeah, that's, that's basically that's where we are now is learning what we have to i also um there was somebody who has a github name that is a lot of random characters so that person's at Lyft, right? That, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm reviewing their PR, which does something to uh, adding stats to Redis. And yep. I actually, when reviewing that, I proposed and he or she agreed that um, when we came across like a Reddit command we never heard of, that we wouldn't like dynamically generate a new stat for that and we would just call it unknown. Right. And, if we actually go with that kind of pattern, that reduces the risk a whole lot. Yeah, um, and that and that might be the way to start, right? Is let's just do that, and then let's just see how it goes. And then if people complain about that, we can we can iterate. That would certainly make me a lot more comfortable. Yeah, that way we would err on the side of maybe the stats don't give you the detail you want, but you would not um, run into. Yep. That would be hard. To yeah, and, and that's something that again, I mean, we can always change or make configurable later, but that certainly seems like a safer way to start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the 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 person I, I I really don't understand why he picked that GitHub name, but uh, <laughs> it, it's like a hash of like tw tw I, I don't I don't even know. But uh, his his name is Nick. Uh, if you want to talk to him directly, just 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 let let me know, and I can. I can make intros. Okay, no worries. I think that this PR is almost good to go. I just had some. Okay. So. All right. Cool. Yeah, real hard to post the Envoy 2019 schedule, uh, which has permissions issues. So it's set. But Sorry, what's that? Sorry, what's that? Which schedule? The Envoy schedule. Oh, schedule. Oh, oh, it's 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 posted. Not uh, it's not public yet, but um, it will be soon. Sorry. Oh, exciting. I'm excited. So if we have people on our team that want to register. We should have them register before that goes public. Because <laughs> <laughs> then it will instantly sell out. I have a, a calendar reminder for today of actually buying tickets, which got bumped to next week because there's never time for anything. Well, that. It may become impossible with the schedule like that, so you might want to adjust. I think there's, I think there's still plenty of uh, tickets. I think though that they're saying that when the schedule goes up, people will start buying tickets. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, it's probably a good idea to get your, get your stuff. Um, awesome. Anyone have anything else? I think so. Okay. See you guys. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.